our second scripture reading today it comes out of the book of Mark, and it's chapter 12. Uh, let's see, verses 28 to 34. Jesus has come into Jerusalem. He's cleansed the temple. And now he is answering everyone's questions. The religious leaders, the crowds, and even his own disciples. So hear the word of God. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment? is the first of all. Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him, there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we dare to ask you questions. We have so many questions. So I ask that today, by illuminating your word through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would answer some of our questions today. And we ask it in the name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Jesus is mentioning a very powerful word in this in this text, it's the word neighbor. And I don't know about you, but all during COVID, I've been looking out my window and seeing all my neighbors, half of whom or more than that have gotten dogs or they're walking with their kids. They're all out on the street in front of their homes. And it occurred to me that there is a lot of them that are new and that I don't know a ton of them. And I began to ask myself, well, if I don't know them, how can I love them? How can I be a good neighbor? Because during COVID, I've also been hearing tons of bad neighbor stories. Uh, friends will complain that their neighbor erected a fence and knocked down one of the bushes, or that their um, a neighbor um, you know, denied their request to build, um, I don't know, addition on their home, in one case. Um, neighbors who stay up too late, who play music too loudly, or the bad neighbors, bad kids who park in the wrong spots, or the bad neighbors who don't pick up their dog's waste. There's just seems like I've been hearing them and hearing them. And of course, then I find out that Netflix has a whole new series called The Bad Neighbor. So it's clearly a thing. It's not just in my own neighborhood, among my own community that I'm hearing this. I, I think you've probably heard in the news that the killers of Ahmad Arbery, um, a black man who was jogging in, I guess, a white neighborhood, and these three men killed him, that, that jury is now... Um, you know, that, that's going to go to trial. And, you know, something like that just makes me wonder, you know, would I have been that, that person in the neighborhood who called 911? You know, I hope not. But tragedies can occur when people don't live out this, what we read today about being a good neighbor. And all over the world, in, we see stories where neighbor, neighbors turn against neighbors with tragic consequences. I don't know if you remember the Hotel Rwanda, which 
related the story of the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda, where one group turned on the other group. They, they all lived together and massacred them. Or of course, we have the example of the Nazis with the Jews. And um, we have today's Israel and Palestine. So there's no end to these situations where people do not see one another as neighbor. When um, during COVID, my son and daughter-in-law moved into moved into our neighborhood, which you know gives us no end of delight. But it wasn't long before one of their next door neighbors came over and introduced themselves, said, "Let me know how I can help you. We want to be a part of your lives. You know, we want to babysit your child." <laughs> they were just so wonderful. But on the other side, the other neighbors next door never introduced themselves. They would be out in the front yard and they wouldn't even speak to Joe and Aaron. And so it wasn't, and also there was some yelling and it wasn't long before Joe and Aaron had dubbed them the good neighbor and the bad neighbor. And I, and I said to them, you know, don't, don't be so fast to judge. You don't really know them, but those labels stuck, which made me really sad because Jesus has a lot to say about our neighbor. And so in this text, in the book of Mark, one of the first things that happens is Jesus comes and he's baptized and he announces to everybody that can hear the kingdom of God has come here. Then he goes out into his neighborhood and he welcomes people in that were previously not welcomed into the neighborhood. He welcomes um, a tax collector to eat with him. He, he, he heals a, a a demoniac, someone that's possessed by a demon, so that this person can be brought back in to the community. He heals a paralytic and a woman with a, a, an awful issue of blood. Basically, people that other people said, who sinned? Them or their parents. But there's a lot of these instances where Jesus is concerned with bringing these people into his, his neighborhood. And at the same time, he is pretty brutally criticizing the religious leaders of his time and also his disciples. He says of the scribes, because he's already criticized the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs and hypocrites. He says to the scribes, hey, you know what? You guys love to wear a long robe and go into the marketplace and have everybody fawn all over you, but you steal widows' money. And you want to have the best seat at the table at every banquet. And that's going to earn condemnation for you. He says to his disciples, oh, let's see, James and John were arguing about who got the best seat in heaven. And he, um, he caught them fighting over who's, who among them was the greatest. So clearly, Jesus is concerned with how we see one another. And this idea of being neighbor, because everybody in this time knew the text, knew the law, but practically no one was doing it. And that's why I think Jesus comes and answers the scribe this way. Jesus has come to not He's come to recreate the commandment of God. And so what he does, he does a couple of things that are very interesting. He takes these two separate commandments that are in different places in the Mosaic law. There's like 630. He takes these two. He combines them. Love God, love neighbor. And he says, there's no commandment greater than these. No one had ever done that before. He also in a sense, makes it more difficult. Because at the time, there was a rabbi named Hillel. And so, you know, what, what this great teacher wanted to do is he said he wanted to summarize the commandments of the Torah into a simple saying that one could say while standing on one foot. I kid you not, that's what he said. And what he did was well, he stood on one foot, which I'm not going to try and do, and said, don't do to somebody something you don't want them to do to you. That's how this great rabbinic scholar of the time summarized the law of God, Jesus turns it around. And we know this, we've heard this before. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
which is a lot harder. And then finally, what he does, which is radical, he extends this law to everyone. At the time, Jews only had to keep these commandments as regards to other Jews. But Jesus, and we know the story of the Good Samaritan, where he teaches that our neighbor is every other human being. It's so, it's so, um, we're so used to this commandment. It's so woven into our faith life. It's hard for us to step back and go, oh my goodness, this man is going to get in a lot of trouble, which he did. But he tells the people, I've come to, not to abolish this law. I've come to fulfill it. And Jesus does that by calling himself the light of the world. So when God was creating all things and said, let there be light, God had in, in God's plan, the plan to incarnate God's love into the world. And so Jesus is announcing that's what's happened. This light has come to expose the darkness, to bring justice and mercy to all people. And to announce to people that that's what it means that the kingdom of God has come near. And at some point, the kingdom of God will be fulfilled. And, and that, that's part of what he's come to do. And so he's basically saying, pay attention, because something has changed. Jesus taught in parables. And I think we all know how effective they are because sometimes you can tell people the do's and don'ts of rules. It doesn't really sink in until you have a story. And so um, I, I love some of the spiritual practices in the Ignatian tradition. And some of the women um, in our fellowship, we've been exploring those. And one of the offers, invitations, is to sit with the text and imagine. Ask God, speak through my imagination, teach me. And so here's what God gave me, a parable that Jesus might have said but just didn't get recorded. The kingdom of God is like a man who moves into a dark neighborhood and builds a lighthouse and installs in it an amazing, beautiful light that shines out into the neighborhood to show people both where the dangers are and also to beckon people into a place of safety and sustenance and community. And before the man leaves, he sets a lighthouse keeper in charge of the light. And then he leaves and he goes out into the world to build more and more lighthouses. So I really love that picture. And so here's Jesus with this scribe who has been kind of one of his mortal enemies. And here comes this guy and he actually says, I'm sure Jesus was shocked. You're right. I get it. I, I can see what you're saying. And, and Jesus, I think Jesus is amazing. He goes, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. I can hear Jesus say, follow me. Come and be one of my disciples. Because my disciples don't really get it. And, you know, I'm not making this up. Jesus called his own disciples a faithless generation. And so that opens the door for us to be able to criticize today's disciples. And certainly because we're reformed and our motto is reformed people are, we're reformed and always reforming. We have to really pay attention to what's going on in the world and be able to criticize mainly ourselves. So what I see going on today with the disciples of Jesus Christ in this country really breaks my heart. And I'm including all of us, so don't think I'm not talking about everybody here, including myself. But I see some of the disciples trying to reinstate an Old Testament law of right and wrong and in and out. I see other disciples allowing themselves to be formed into a voting block for political purposes and that's going on in all, on all sides. I see disciples being formed by the culture so much that they come into a church, if they come at all, 
just to get fueled up to go back out to build their own kingdom, not the kingdom of God. And I know we could say more. And we all stand, you know, we all stand in the light of Christ that exposes all the darkness. We have to be able to do this. We can't say, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to criticize my own people. We're really wonderful. History does not bear that out. So back to Joe and Aaron. So a couple of months later, Joe and Aaron were looking out the window at the first snowstorm. It was a big one. Joe and Aaron didn't have a shovel. I don't think they even had a scraper. They certainly didn't have a blower. And so Aaron is looking out the window, wondering what in the world they're going to do. And here comes the bad neighbor with his snowblower. And he blows the front walk, and then he blows right up to the front door, turns around, and goes home. And here's what Aaron said, because she said I could use this story. She goes, I think the snow clearing changed everything for sure. That winter felt never ending with my newborn and a return to work and COVID. For someone to help us without being asked and not even mentioning it, warmed us up to them. All of a sudden, the bad neighbor has become the good neighbor. Why? Because he showed mercy. And so thinking about that is um, also convicting because you know what? Anyone can show mercy. You don't have to be a follower of God to show mercy. But the disciples of Jesus Christ are commanded to show mercy. This is what Jesus has just said. We need to hear that. This is not a maybe or possible. This is a command from God. And so dwelling with this scripture has made me ask a lot of questions. Some of them are these ultimate questions that I think we, we sometimes ask ourselves, maybe not often enough, like, why am I even here? Why am, what is the meaning for what I'm doing? Why did Jesus ask me to follow him? Why do I live in the neighborhood I live in, among the neighbors I live among? Well, this scripture helps me answer a couple of these questions for myself. One, as I truly believe, I'm there to incarnate God's love for my neighbors. And I'm there to do it for my good neighbors and my bad neighbors. And I'm there to be a good neighbor. Okay. But those questions then lead me to ask us, what are we doing here and now in this place at this time, sitting in a church that I got to tell you looks a lot like a lighthouse, which to me is kind of wonderful. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? Are we simply coming in to fill up so that we can just go back and out and build our own kingdom? Or are we here to know God better, know one another better, know, our, know ourselves better so that we can love God better, love ourselves better, and love one another better? That's what we're here. And we're here to also keep kindled in us this light of Christ that, that is the gift that we get from a gracious and merciful God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're here to remember. Jesus said, remember me. So that's one reason we're here, remember what Christ has done so that we can then go out into our neighborhoods fueled up to build God's kingdom. You know, it's just not enough for us to have faith. It's great. We get together, we share our faith, we sing our faith. But that's why I chose the James scripture, because faith without works is dead. And I think that Christians get criticized a lot by the outside world because we're, you know, we talk a lot about faith, but what is it that we do? You know, are we really living out this commandment? And so tonight, for Halloween, I'm going to be outside. Now, years ago, when I was involved in a um, pretty, um, I'd say pretty conservative, evangelically rooted 
ministry, Moms in Prayer, which I've talked about a lot. I mean, it saved my life. I believe it saved the lives of my kids. But um, I was really debating with some friends, you know, we really shouldn't be doing this Halloween thing. You know, it's, it's about demons and, you know, the dark. And maybe we ought to just stay home. And I will never forget, and I believe it was from God, this weird idea that came into my imagination. And so I'm going to do that weird thing tonight in my front lawn that I've done for over a dozen years. And that is I'm going to build a big fire, open flame with logs. I load up sharp wooden skewers with marshmallows and I hand them to small children and point them towards the fire. <laughs> it's not that bad, actually. I have a lot of safety pro protocols in place. And Frank will be there with a bucket of water just in case. You know, we always, we're always ready and we're always prepared. But <clears throat> the reason that I do it is because I realized the hunger that I had to know my neighbors. And, and this would be one way that I would make them stop long enough to, it takes a while to roast a marshmallow just unless you eat it raw, which is not very good. And, and so they'll sit there and they'll, they'll roast marshmallows. And we have kids that have never roasted a marshmallow before, which is kind of a rite of passage from childhood, I think. And people linger by the warmth of the fire. They talk. And I've met a lot of neighbors that way. So I'm really looking forward to tonight um, where I build my big fire. But I'm going to be there not just to know my neighbors better, but to learn how I can love them better. And as I light that fire and tend that fire, because you got to keep putting logs on it and building it up, I might be the only one that knows what I'm really doing. I am tending the light of Christ in my little lighthouse, in my little neighborhood, because I'm a lighthouse keeper, and so are you. And so I, I hope that we can take seriously what it is to receive this call on our lives from, from God himself to become the love of Christ for our neighbors and to get closer and closer to the kingdom of God until, until God's reign comes on to earth. And so may God watch over us and keep us tending the flame.